like this without the dedicated work of some particular people. Uh, I want to thank Betsy Myers and Sarah Cruz and their great staff of the external affairs team, Kathy McLaughlin and the Institute of Politics team, Bonnie Newman and all her great people in administration and the media services people, particularly Jao Ops, and the many alumni and staff volunteers that you'll see here. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank Isabel, because by taking a westward track, she has literally made this event possible. <laughs> and uh, you can't imagine the angst that was going on in these halls about Monday or Tuesday as we read the weather maps that said we might be uh, in the heart of the, uh, of the hurricane. Every June, uh, I get to stand up as dean of the Kennedy School before the assembled masses in the Tercentenary Theater and tell the president and fellows and the overseers of Harvard that I am presenting to them some 550 students who are prepared to lead in public service. Those are the formal terms that I certify our graduates with every year. And I'd like to think a little bit about what public service is and how it's been changing. If you type the words public service into Google or any other search engine, you'll get something like seven million replies. I'm not going to go through all seven million this morning. When we think of public service, um, we think of hopes and ideals, but that doesn't tell you what public service really is. We can demonstrate it, I think, uh, just by pointing to our alumni who are serving in significant elected offices or major appointed offices. Uh, at last count, there were three from the Kennedy School in the Senate, 16 in the House of Representatives, 19 state senators, 22 in other state legislations, legislators, 16 in other state offices, 27 in city and local government offices, 17 appointed to U.S. federal government positions, five, those are presidential appointments, five appointed to state offices, 17 appointed in international offices, and six running for office this year. So quite clearly, that's an illustration of what public service is. And that's just in the U.S. If you think about uh, the rest of the world, a number of our students and graduates have served as presidents, cabinet officials, members of parliament and civil servants in a large number of countries. And that number is likely to increase since in the 1990s we have greatly increased the proportion of foreign students at the Kennedy School, making it the most international school at Harvard. But we also did another thing in the 1990s, which was to try to think with a faculty study group about what public service meant in the sense of the way the government was changing and the role of government was changing. We created a faculty study group that we called Visions of Governance for the 21st Century to understand how some of the deep trends, information revolution, globalization, bigger, bigger and better markets that were creating more marketization, how are these things affecting government, particularly in a climate in which the mistrust of government was increasing. And this group, as we work together, discovered that what we have to learn to do is think in terms of governance, not just government. Government is part of governance, and governance is the way we manage our collective or public lives together. And what we find is that in this 21st century, much of governance, much of that management of our collective lives together is being handled in part by government, but also by the private and nonprofit sectors as well. And that the relationships between them, the partnerships, the interactions, are going to be much more complex than they were in the 20th century. And in that sense, we have to rethink what we mean about public service. Public service and public leadership then can be accomplished in a variety of ways. People can be public leaders in the private and nonprofit sector as well as while they're serving in government. And in that sense, what we have to realize is that in a world of distributed governance, distributed among these three major sectors, many of our graduates are going to serve 
in different sectors at different times of their long careers but what we want to do is hope to train them to be public leaders and to provide public service no matter which particular sector they may be located in at any particular time and that means that the concept of public service is involved evolving to encompass the creation of shared benefits for any community as a whole as opposed to a part of it that means that our graduates are leaders in trying to produce collective or public goods for communities that's an important thing it makes us different let's say from the business school where they're trying to increase shareholder value and a very important thing for the country and the economy as a whole but there's another dimension which is to create public value and that's essentially what we're training people for no matter which of the sectors they happen to be in at any particular time and leadership in producing public value leadership in the idea of creating public service doesn't necessarily correlate perfectly with rank you can obviously be a leader if you're the president of the United States but you can also be a leader as president of the local PTA or you can be a leader as a cabinet secretary or a leader as a librarian or as a teacher the best test of leadership in providing public service is to ask a question of whether this group of people that I'm working with is achieving its goals better because I'm a part of it and you don't have to be the chairman of the group to be able to answer that in a positive way you don't have to be the president to answer that in a positive way but think that through ask yourself that test is this group of people better able to accomplish its goals because I am a part of it and if we're thinking of public service is this group of people better able to contribute to public values to public goods because I'm a part of it and I think that's what we're trying to do as we think of this latest phase of the Kennedy School what I sometimes call our third phase that we're going to be celebrating that our job is to basically train public leaders who can in short make the world a better place public service is also an art an art of transformation and as many of you know I've spent some of my career in and out of government and certainly while in government I had the uh, chance to practice the art and enjoy some of the rewards that go along with it but we also do public service here in this school our faculty and students and friends and alumni transform and have a tremendous impact on the world through other forms of public service here we advance the pursuit of interdisciplinary and international initiatives in spheres ranging from democratic governance to human rights to nonprofit institutions in that sense we hope that the research and teaching that we do here contributes to a rigorous debate and the development of informed public policy at home and abroad so I want to say that uh, greetings to you all as we celebrate our involvement with public service here for 25 years on the banks of the Charles this indeed is the anniversary of our coming into this building it's a long-standing mission but we're particularly privileged to have been in, able to carry it out right here for the last 25 years finally our current students are really the future of public service and I thought more interesting than just hearing from a dean talking about big concepts would be to talk to real people who are public leaders and will be again improved public leaders and for that let me introduce first Lisa Jones uh, Lisa has a very interesting background and I trust a very interesting future Ingmar Bergman once said that no art passes our conscience the way film does and throughout her career Lisa has worked to create images that use the power of film to its full effect as a producer and co-producer of a dozen films she's taken a special interest in topics that increase our awareness of African American and African subjects ranging from the African experience in colonial America to the life of heavyweight champion Joe Lewis she's received the Edward R Murrow Award from the Overseas Press Club for her 1998 film Ambush in Mogadishu and other films she has worked on have 
won numerous awards, including an Emmy and a Peabody. Ten years ago, Ebony Magazine named her one of the 30 leaders of the future, and her presence in our mid-career class this year is our way of saying we agree. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Jones. Thank you, Dean Nye, for that wonderful introduction. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with the Dean to welcome you to the Kennedy School. Welcome. My name is Lisa Jones, and as the Dean mentioned, I'm a mid-career student and PA in the class of 2004. This year's mid-career class of 224 represents 200 and, <clears throat> sorry, represents 59 countries and a myriad of fields of public service. Although I've only been a Kennedy School student since this summer, this place has a way from the very first day of making you feel a part of its intellectual and creative energy. This school has an infectious quality. It challenges you to work hard, to expand your mind, and to meet the many fascinating people that make up this community. Although I have just begun school, it has already proven to be one of the best life decisions I have ever made. I have been asked to share with you my background and the reasons that I have come to the Kennedy School. I have been in the field of documentary television for 15 years and have worked on historical and political documentaries for McNeil Lair Productions, HBO, ABC, to name a few. But my stint as a line producer for PBS's Frontline is really what made me want to spend a year here at the Kennedy School. After working on Ambush in Mogadishu, a frontline film that re-examined the <coughs> um, US and UN intervention in Somalia, we, and after being sponsored by the South African government to tour the country and get to meet President Nelson Mandela, I wanted to make a film on HIV AIDS in Southern Africa. Traveling through that country in 1998 was energizing. While the country was in the midst of positive, profound political change, it was also on the brink of a devastating epidemic that would de decimate a large portion of the population. Neither their government nor the world community were making HIV AIDS as a priority. For now, so now, five years later, I am here at the Kennedy School to delve further into the topics of human rights, international relations, and U.S. foreign policy, to try to make a difference in that region of the world through a documentary film. Throughout the year, I will explore the content, determine my story, write my treatment, and create a budget, and then go back and pitch it to Frontline and to other distribution outlets. I already know that my world has opened up more widely in these two short months. Being here for the year of classwork, interacting with my fellow national and international classmates, and being a part of this committed, engaged, and brilliant community, I will be pushed and prodded. I know I will leave here having a deeper and richer understanding of my subject matter, of myself, and I will make a more nuanced and better film as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Now let me introduce Peter Greer. Peter is an MPP2 student and a public service fellow. Every year, more than a third of our students attend, uh, are interested in the topic of international development. Basically, this is a concern for how we solve some of the difficult problems facing the half of the world's population that lives on less than $2 a day. Prior to attending the Kennedy School, Peter served from 1999 to 2002 as the managing director of Urwego, a community banking program in Rwanda. Before that, he was a microfinance technical advisor in Cambodia for World Relief International. And at the Kennedy School, we often talk of scholar practitioners who've had experience in the real world as well as academia. Peter is also been applying his know-how on the home front in the classroom, serving this past summer as an instructor on the Microenterprise Development Institute in Southern New Hampshire University. Please join me in welcoming Peter Greer.
Thank you very much, Dean Nye, for the introduction, and more importantly, for your example of what um, public service means here at this institution and with this community. Prior to coming to the Kennedy School, as Dean Nye stated, I did serve as the managing director of a Rwandan microfinance institution. We were offering financial services to 10,000 poor Rwandan women who were excluded from the formal financial sector because they had no collateral, had no way of accessing loans. But what these women did have was wonderful ideas. They had hard work and they had initiative. What they didn't have was access to capital. So we worked in, we worked in partnership with them, provided the financial services, and there's no question that they just took that little bit, those small loans, and had a major impact on their communities. Looking back, the most rewarding aspect of my work in Rwanda and in Cambodia was seeing the drastic changes that occurred when these hardworking women received a small amount of capital. They used these loans to improve their businesses or start businesses, and in turn, they used their increased profits to revolutionize their communities. We were able to see houses being built, children going to school, um, health and nutrition, that you could literally see the difference in the health of the, of, the, of the children. But my experience also convinced me that there are no simple answers. The problems facing the world today are more complex than I ever imagined. And there is no silver bullet. There is no magic solution. We're only beginning to see the impact of HIV and AIDS. And seeing that firsthand um, really makes you realize the extent of the crisis that's facing many parts of our world. Conflict continues to escalate in many parts of the world as well. And again, there are no easy solutions to that. So coming to the Kennedy School has afforded me the opportunity to take a step back, to critically think, to analyze, to get increased skill sets so that I can more effectively work for change um, in this world. And I cannot think of a better place to engage in that sort of critical thinking. I have found that the faculty and staff members that I have gotten to know are not just interested in academics, but they're interested in application. And they make sure that they are applying their field of learning at the individual level. For example, Michael Ignatieff teaches several courses on human rights. But you can tell that he applies what he's learning about the dignity and worth of people in the way that you interact with them, in the way that he treats his students. You have someone like Dean McCarthy who doesn't just say that he supports students, but you can go to his office and he is always willing to clear his calendar and to fit you in. That to me is what, um, what leadership really is, that application. Additionally, my fellow students have expanded and sharpened my thinking through our discussions and debates. And this forum has played a key role in that being able to interact with world leaders and to have a chance to ask them questions and to really find out how does what we're studying, how does what we're learning in the classroom apply to the real world. So looking forward, I know that I'm about to begin the much more challenging task of translating my increased knowledge into action. I believe that my job is to find out how to effectively apply what I've learned here at the Kennedy School in the world and work for change. I know that I'm better equipped for that pursuit as a result of my time here. I also know that I've built friendships and found colleagues who are eager to work in partnership with those same goals, those same ideals. And I know that I'm joining a network of alumni who are also committed to public service and who are, as John F. Kennedy once said, willing to dream of things that never were. Many people have invested in me and many people have invested in this school to make it what it is and to allow me to have the opportunity to study here. And just as I was able to see the very tangible results of investing in poor Rwandan women, I hope that everyone who has invested in this place is able to see dividends in the lives of the world's less fortunate. So it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of this public service celebration. And I couldn't be more thankful for all the people who have made this place and this day happen. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Um, Betsy Myers is going to say a couple of words about uh, procedures. And uh, I must say that, uh, as I introduced her in a general position earlier, I now can give her more personal tribute. Betsy has just been terrific. She's been the person who's made all this happen. If she looks slightly haggard, it's because you should have been in her shoes Monday night, <laughs> watching weather reports till the wee hours. Betsy. Thank you, Joe. Um, this, uh, 
event has been a long time in coming. And I woke up this morning and I couldn't really believe that the day was here. And I wanted to say to all of you in the audience and all the people that will be joining us today that this event is really celebrating everyone in this audience. You come, all of you have different roles and parts that you've contributed to the school. So today is one long celebration of all the contributions that we all make as a community to change the world. I wanted to thank our students who took their time today to join us because we always hear from our alumni and donors and fellows and people who come that what a treat it is to hear from our students, uh, to, to see the kinds of people that we are turning out every year to go out into the world to make a difference. And every year upon graduation that I've been here, I've just served three years as alumni director, I always feel sad when that crop of students leaves. But then every year in the summer school, the students, new students come to school, and there's an exercise they do where they stand up for 15 seconds and tell a little bit about themselves. And this year I went, and a young man in our mid-career class from Cameroon said, I have come to the Kennedy School as a citizen of the world, and I hope to leave the Kennedy School as a leader of the world. And that has touched me greatly, and I think about that all the time. Because I think that's what we all do here, is that we are leaders of the world, and we are creating leaders of the world. And in that, I've thought a lot about our dean, Joe Nye, who is a true leader in a place that makes, and he's made a huge difference as dean. And I just want to quickly say, as alumni director, a couple things about his leadership that have allowed us to make progress and create this day. He sets an example and never asks his staff to do anything that he does not do himself. He keeps his word. And when he brought me on, he said, we care about alumni, we need to do more for alumni, and I promise you that we will build your team. And when the school went through a little bit of a budget, a budget, uh, what do we call it? Deficit. <laughs> I didn't want to say that word, um, the D word. Um, he said, we froze, uh, we, did no, we, we froze our hiring, but Joe said, you know what, I promised that we were going to build upon our alumni programs, and I promised Betsy she could have another person. So we added a person to do reunions, and every year now we bring back our alums to the school. And the, the side benefit that's come from that is that this year, last year, our alums that came back to the school contributed $250,000 uh, back to the Joe to do things like fellowships and scholarships and debt re uh, relief. So I think he's made a huge difference. And lastly, I want to say that the wonder, most wonderful thing about Joe is that he allows us to be creative and that we can take risks without fear. So today is one big risk. <laughs> And you will see when you go out to the tent for lunch, this is something we've never done before. And uh, we have over 800 people RSVP'd for the lunch. Now, we might not have that many because of the weather. And I do thank God that Isabel has been somewhat kind to us today. But it's a wonderful day, and I, I just wanted to say welcome, and that the sum of all the parts of this school make it the wonderful place that it is, and it's been a privilege to serve as the alumni director here. And lastly, I just want to say, could Sean and Madeline, in saying the sum of all the parts, every part of this school has been involved in this event. And I want to just quickly run through, um, as Joe said, the housekeeping. You guys, please. Um, there is an amazing group of volunteers, and the sum of all the parts. Sean Bowen <coughs> is the executive director of the Hauser Center. And Madeline Yuck, who is the chair of our Alumni Executive Council, are heading up our volunteer program today. You will see many, many people with the, with the, the uh, crimson sash. And they are here to help you and answer any questions. We are set with umbrellas for people who don't have them when you're walking to various places. Uh, when I finish, Joe is going to turn the program over to our opening panel, David Gergen, who's going to be moderating. After that session, all of you that are joining us for lunch have a ticket in your packet that has a color. And what we're going to try to do is if you have pink or red tickets, you will exit through those doors. And if you have green or yellow ticket, 
you will exit through the JFK doors, and there will be volunteers there to help guide you. And this is to help the flow of getting into the tent. After our wonderful celebration of public service luncheon, we will then go to the center panels, and nine of our centers are going to be hosting panels on various subjects, and you have that in your registration packet. But we will also have in the, in the lobby of each of the buildings, Litauer, Belfer, and Taubman, easels with all of the choices for the center panels. So they're going to be running concurrently from 2.30 to 4. When those panels end, you will all exit your buildings, and the doors will open here at JFK uh, Street to open for the form rededication. So you'll come in through those doors, they open at 4, and that starts at 5 o'clock. So that gives you some time to get seated and catch your breath. And then, uh, and that following that will be the reception, and there'll be people there. But all through the day, there'll be lots of people to answer your questions, any issues that you have, needs that you have, concerns, we're here to help you. So again, thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day. And I now turn the program over to Joe Nye, our wonderful dean. Thank you, Betsy. I should should have pointed out that Betsy herself was a student just three years ago in the mid-career program. And uh, hearing from Lisa and Peter reminds me to, that the thing that makes this so exciting is there are about 900 other people just as exciting as they are. And, uh, but we didn't think we could get all of them on stage at the same time. We are going to now have a panel about public service. And to chair that, to moderate it, uh, we have a terrific exemplar of public service, uh, David Gergen. Uh, David is public service professor of uh, public leadership and director of our Center for Public Leadership here at the school. Um, over the past three decades, David has served in the White House uh, as advisor to four different presidents, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton. In the mid-1980s, he began a career in journalism, becoming editor of U.S. News and World Report. He then uh, uh, joined the Kennedy School faculty in January of 99, while still remaining an editor-at-large of U.S. News and a frequent television analyst. And in the fall of 2000, he published a wonderful book, which became a bestseller, called Eyewitness to Power, The Essence of Leadership, Nixon to Clinton. So David has, uh, knows a lot about what he's going to be moderating or telling us about. But uh, I wanted to add one note, which is that Somebody with this public prominence and experience could easily come to the Kennedy School and treat it as a pied à terre or a place to drop in or something of that sort. On the contrary, David has been at the heart of the school. He has become really the key figure in our public leadership uh, area, and uh, his course is vastly oversubscribed, and he's always willing to take time and meet with students. He has uh, really demonstrated leadership at that level as well as at the White House level. So it's with great gratitude that I turn you over to David Gergen. David? Good morning, and welcome to all of you uh, the new status. It's so good to see so many uh, uh, wonderful faces from the years of the people who have helped to build this school and those who have been so, such great supporters now. And thank you for coming uh, through this weather and, and joining us here today. Um, I, I might say, as before we start, as, as uh, Joe Nye hands off the baton here, I think that all of you know that uh, our good dean, uh, announced uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to standing ovations from the faculty uh, that his plans to retire at the end of this year and much of this day as we celebrate the Kennedy School and celebrate its contributions and its, and its, and its future, I think that all of us will recognize time and again how much that uh, 
D9 has come to symbolize the best of the school. All right. <clears throat> Others will speak, uh, there'll be other occasions here during the day to speak about him, but I just want to tell you as one member of the faculty and as someone who's been a, a friend of his for some years and worked with him in government, uh, this school could not have had a better dean. We've been really, really fortunate to, to have his service for as many years as, as we have. Uh, our panel this morning is on, on politics and public service with an emphasis on service. A few years ago, uh, a journalist by the name of Bob Kimberg from the Baltimore Sun published a book that attracted a good deal of attention. It was, a, it was a series of profiles of four men who had graduated from the Naval Academy and, and their lives through public service. And he entitled it, The Nightingale's Song. Why? Well, as he points out, uh, a young nightingale remains silent, does not sing until it hears an older nightingale. And upon hearing an older nightingale, it breaks into beautiful song and continues to sing the rest of its life. Well, back in the 1960s, I think that many of us believe that the older nightingale of that generation was John F. Kennedy. It was his song that inspired so many to enter public life, to enter public service, uh, this day is built in part around his memory as we rededicate this forum and remember his son later today. So the organizers thought it might be well if we began this morning's panel with a brief video clip from a, uh, what has often been called the, the best speech that John F. Kennedy ever gave that nobody knows about. <laughs> it's a speech he gave in May 1963. <laughs> on the campus of Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, not far from David right. Pryor's uh, uh, good home. And uh, you should know the context. Uh, not only was uh, the space missions in the, in the news at that time, but civil rights was roiling the country. And at that very week, Governor Wallace in Alabama was vowing to block Kennedy's efforts at integration, the national government's efforts at integration, to stand in the school door. And so that Kennedy had very much on his mind as he went to Vanderbilt, uh, not only service, but the rule of law. And I think you will hear echoed in this and, and understand that context. So what we're going to do is to watch this film and then turn to the panel. And I'm going to ask each member of the panel if they had a nightingale in their life earlier what inspired them to come into public service. We'll take it from there. We'll have a conversation here on the, with the panel, and then we'll open up to questions. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's roll tape. I think you can see it up here. But this nation was not founded solely on the principle of citizen rights, equally important, though too often not discussed, is the citizen's responsibility. For our privileges can be no greater than our obligations. The protection of our rights can endure no longer than the performance of our responsibilities. Each can be neglected only at the peril of the other. I speak to you today, therefore not of your rights as Americans, but of your responsibilities. They are many in number and different in nature. They do not rest with equal weight upon the shoulders of all. Equality of opportunity does not mean equality of responsibility. All Americans must be responsible citizens, but some must be more responsible than others by virtue of their public or their private position, their role in the family or community, their prospects for the future, or their legacy from the past. Increased responsibility goes with increased ability. For all those to whom much is given, much is required. 
You have responsibilities, in short, to use your talents for the benefit of the society which helped develop those talents. You must decide, as Goethe put it, whether you will be an anvil or a hammer, whether you will give to the world in which you were reared and educated the broadest possible benefit of that education, of the many special obligations incumbent upon an educated citizen, I would cite three as outstanding. Your obligation to the pursuit of learning, your obligation to serve the public, your obligation to uphold the law. If the pursuit of learning is not defended by the educated citizen, it will not be defended at all. For there will always be those who scoff at intellectuals, who cry out against research, who seek to limit our educational system. Modern cynics and skeptics see no more reason for landing a man on the moon, which we shall do, than the cynics and skeptics. <laughs> a half a millennium ago, saw for the discovery of this country. They see no harm in paying those to whom they entrust the minds of their children a smaller wage than is paid to those to whom they entrust the care of their plumbing. But the educated citizen knows how much more there is to know. He knows that knowledge is power, more so today than ever before. He knows that only an educated and informed people will be a free people. That the ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all. And that if we can, as Jefferson put it, enlighten the people generally, tyranny and the oppressions of mind and body will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. And therefore, the educated citizen has a special obligation to encourage the pursuit of learning, to promote exploration of the unknown, to preserve the freedom of inquiry, to support the advancement of research, and to assist at every level of government the improvement of education for all Americans, from grade school to graduate school. Secondly, the educated citizen has an obligation to serve the public. He may be a precinct worker or president. He may give his talents at the courthouse, the state house, the White House. He may be a civil servant or a senator, a candidate or a campaign worker, a winner or a loser. But he must be a participant and not a spectator. Aristotle wrote, it is not the finest and strongest men who are crowned, but they who enter the list. For out of these the prized men are selected. So too in life, he said, of the honorable and the good, it is they who act who rightly win the prize. I urge all of you today, especially those who are students, to act to enter the list of public service and rightly win or lose the prize. For we can have only one form of aristocracy in this country. As Jefferson wrote long ago in rejecting John Adams' suggestion of an artificial aristocracy of wealth and birth, it is, he wrote, the natural aristocracy of character and talent. And the best form of government, he added, was that which selected these men for positions of responsibility. I would hope that all educated citizens would fulfill this obligation in politics, in government, here in Nashville, here in this state, in the Peace Corps, in the Foreign Service, in the Government Service, in the Tennessee Valley, in the world. You will find the pressures greater than the pain. You may endure more public attacks than support. 
but you will have the unequal satisfaction of knowing that your character and talent are contributing to the direction and success of this free society. Great. Wow. <laughs> that was strong, wasn't it? So, to our panelists, and let's talk about who inspired them. How did they get into public service and ask for uh, a moment or two of reflection upon public service as they, as they found it? We'll begin uh, with one of the favorites here at the Kennedy School, uh, Senator David Pryor, uh, who uh, have, I think I added it up, David, 28 years of elective office experience is that right a long time on the public dole <laughs> six years in the house four years as governor and and an election which i in which i believe you've defeated governor faubus residents of what we just watched and then 18 years in the united states senate is that is that right that is right add to it six years in the state legislature and so, six years yeah, in the so state anyway. legislature yeah. and and very importantly i'm running for the school board next year so. <laughs> <laughs> the most important of all jobs and and, yeah. and he was the nightingale for one young man who is now in the united states senate who is his son mm -hmm. uh so it's a it's a long record of public service it is, it is one that he followed up, as you know, by coming to the Kennedy School and serving as director of the Institute of Politics. Uh, he's gone on to be, he's now a Fulbright Distinguished Fellow of Law and Public Affairs at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And there's a little politics in today's session. He just came here from Arkansas, where yesterday he introduced one General <laughs> Wesley Clark to uh, an adoring audience. <coughs> David Pryor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Well, honestly, it's so exciting. It's so thrilling for Barbara and myself to return once again after about 15 or 16 months away from the Kennedy School. This is our first visit back. Wonderful memories of this great room. How fitting it is to name and to rename, I should say, now the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Listening to that magnificent speech makes me realize once again the importance the critical importance of the Kennedy School of Government, the Institute of Politics. And once again, we find ourselves at the American intersection, I guess you would say, of theory and reality in the field of politics. David, I don't know if I had one nightingale. I had a lot of nightingales in my life. My mother was a nightingale. She was the first woman in our state who had the courage to ever run for political office. She ran for a uh, clerk of her county, of our county, and she was soundly defeated, I might add. You've been surrounded uh, by strong uh, women all your life. Yeah, I know it. I really have. And Barbara, <laughs> of course, is a nightingale in my yeah. life. But I, I want to tell you a story. On Sunday afternoon last week, we honored four women in our state. These were all nightingales for all of us. In 1958, all of the high schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, were closed. They were closed. There was no high school for students to go to. Can you imagine that? 4,000 high school students had no school to attend. Why? Because the legislature and the governor had basically closed the schools to prevent integration. The men were coward. They were afraid. They owned automobile businesses. They sold insurance. They sold shoes at the shoe store. So they laid back and they said, no, we can't do this. We can't get involved in this. Four brave women started meeting 45 years ago last Sunday afternoon at the home of Mrs. Terry, Mrs. Adolphine Terry. And they formed the Women's Emergency Committee to open our schools. Their homes were stoned, their cars had nails driven through the tires, their, uh, they, their children were ridiculed. The, everything that you could imagine to these four women happened bad that because they were the so-called integrationists of the time in our community of Little Rock. But do you know they were the Nightingales? Hmm. And these four women started building a coalition of people, of like-thinking individuals. And do you know that within about three months, they had recruited, think of it, they had recruited 2,000 women. 2,000 women who said, 
we're not going to tolerate this. We're not going to accept this. We are going to open these schools. And I think that is a powerful Nightingale song, David. And I think that you don't have to be a politician to do something courageous. You don't have to be a politician or a governmental leader or a prime minister or a senator or a governor, Gene, to take the lead and do something to be remembered. You can be a Nightingale in your own hometown, in your own home community. And to me, I would just like to pay respect to those four courageous women, one of whom is still alive, Mrs. Dorothy Morris, who formed the Women's Emergency Committee and were the Nightingales for a lot of people in our community and in our state. Thank you. Wow, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Jean Shaheen has had a, a long and distinguished record of service in her native state of New Hampshire. She first ran for the state legislature there in 1980. Is that correct? Actually, 1990. 1990. Well, I've got to, I, I was misinformed. Then <laughs> you had a faster rise than I thought. Good for you. Uh, but well, so she got into 1990, and six years later, she was a got elected governor mm -hmm. of the state. The first woman who was elected governor of the state. First Democrat in 16 years. Is that correct? Impressive. Impressive. She, uh, as, as you know, she is, was the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire. Um, and I would imagine, because she's the first, she's the most important endorsee, you know, I imagine the first call Wes Clark made yesterday was to Jean Shaheen. He said, Jean, I need your help. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is, oops. Uh oh. Well, whatever that was, is there somebody up there who's all right? <laughs> Are you all all right? <laughs> yeah. That, that's Wes Clark dropping his. Yeah. Anybody's <laughs> <laughs> heard? I'm a lawyer. Oh, yeah. There's more than one lawyer in this room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. right. <laughs> that's wonderful. Oh, uh, wow. Um. <laughs> Jean's involvement in, in New Hampshire politics does go back to the Jimmy Carter campaign in uh, 1976 and, and in 1980, and she, was, uh, she managed Gary Hart's primary campaign in 1984. Uh, I don't know if you'll be managing anybody's campaign now, Jean, but she was here at the Institute of Politics this uh, past year at the Institute of, uh, as, as a fellow, and uh, it was very popular among the students and faculty, and we're delighted to welcome you back, Jean. Tell us about your service and, 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 and your commitment. Thank you. Well, it's very nice to be back. I was actually looking for a permanent position as a fellow here, so Dan, you know, see if you can work that out. Yeah. Um, like so many people who came of age in the 60s, I, I was very much influenced by the civil rights movement, by the women's movement, and I was teaching in a newly integrated school in Mississippi in 1970 mm. when a little known governor named Jimmy Carter was elected in Georgia and he gave this famous speech about the need to end segregation in the South. And as someone who was dealing with those issues on a daily basis, I was very impressed by his willingness to take on that issue when I was not seeing that from elected officials in Mississippi. And so when he started running for president in 1975, I was back in New Hampshire and had the opportunity to get involved in his campaign. And for me, public service has really meant political service. And I don't know that we can really separate the two. I think it's, it's unfortunate that for so many people, um, public service, political service, is no longer the ideal that John Kennedy talked about in that speech. And I think we need to try and revive the public commitment that we had in this country to public service. Hmm. Good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we will come back. I don't, I don't, I'm sure I have the, the number of years right anymore after all this. So uh, Dan Glickman, 
it's my understanding you served for 18 years in the United States Congress, is that right? That's correct. And then served from 1995 to 2001 as Secretary of Agriculture. So that, uh, that gets up, up to almost a quarter of a century of, uh, of, of uh, public service, but you really began it way back with the Wichita School Board. So it goes back even longer before that. Uh, as all of you know, uh, uh, Secretary Glickman uh, came here to the Kennedy School uh, uh, this past year. He had a terrific first year. He took the, the David Pryor passed the baton to him in, in, in that case. Uh, and he's a, been a welcome member here. He's, uh, he's energized his students on election nights and things like that. He's had these, he has had events going on out here. Uh, and it was Dan Glickman who, uh, uh, who, who, who came up with and, and pushed through the renovation of this, uh, of this forum and to, for whom we're, all of us at the school are extremely grateful. Dan, tell us about your public service and thank you for being out here today to help us kick this off. Well, thank you very much, David. <clears throat> uh, there, there were an awful lot of people before me who created the idea of this forum and the renovation. We'll talk about that later, but I'm delighted to be here. Somebody once asked me when I became Secretary of Agriculture, it says, what is it in your career that motivated you to be Secretary of Agriculture? After all, your parents were in the scrap iron business. And I, <laughs> I made comment that Growing up, my mother every day would say to me, eat, 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 you know, that was kind of the, the whole thing. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out what motivates you in this world. Uh, that was pretty good motivation. By the way, I still take advantage of that almost every day. Um, but um, I went to college in the 60s, and I went to the University of Michigan. And in fact, we have a fellow this year, I don't know if he's in the room, is Tom Hayden in the room? Uh, he's back there, he's gonna be one of our fellows this year. Stand if up, Tom Hayden. St stand up, yeah, Tom, yeah, yeah. you know, just so people recognize you back there. And um, the U of M in the 60s was, uh, of course, the formation of the Students for Democratic Society under Tom's leadership, and a lot of, lot of political activism there that I think probably had much to do with my involvement in politics. And also uh, what I saw was the significance of students in changing the world. I mean, when you look at social movements, invariably in the world, it's almost always university students that, whether it's the civil rights or the Vietnam War, just about anything <coughs> major that happens in terms of a monumental movement, it, it comes with kids and students. You know, they get the rest of us older people uh, to be, get shaken up a little bit. And I think that had a lot to do with it. And I also think you can't go far away from your family roots. My grandparents were Russian Jewish immigrants in this country and came here with nothing and, you know, did well. And my grandfather always used to tell me, I, I remember I used to, it's, it's funny, I'm just thinking about this, I used to go to the synagogue with him in the morning and I was in Wichita and there were very, very few Jewish people in Wichita. And about, the, uh, and, and we'd be driving on Saturday morning and he would be giving me a lesson every week because you know he, he was one of these modern guys but believed in in the scriptures and he, he but okay. one just constantly stood with me which was from the Talmud which uh, you've most of you probably heard before which was uh, the comment if you save one life you save the entire world and then that was picked up with Bobby Kennedy's Ripple of Hope speech, remember, in South Africa, where, you know, you drop a stone in a, in a body of water and it sends a ripple uh, li like what human beings ought to do in terms of sending that ripple of hope that actually makes that kind of change. And it's, it's always struck me how, in fact, uh, it is not impossible for one person to actually have a monumental impact on his or her surroundings. And the best way to have that impact is in, in the public arena, which I call the highest calling that anybody can possibly do. And even though, as Gene says, it doesn't have quite the, uh, uh, the, the image uh, that perhaps it did during the days of John Kennedy, although if you read Mark Twain and Will Rogers, the same thing said about politicians today were, were said 40 and 50 and 100 years ago, and, and it's, uh, it's probably, probably worse then. But, but, the, but the fact is, is that, that that had a great impact on me. And the, you know, this, this grandfather of mine who came here with nothing, who kept saying, if you save one life, you save the entire world. And I think it had a lot to do with me getting interested in being in the public arena and um, doing what I am today. So thank you very much, David. Th thank, thank, you. thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, now for a leader from the next generation, uh, Larry Harris Jr., age of 21, he helped to found an organization called United Leaders. 
And it's uh, a group that is trying to recruit and inspire the next generation of idealistic political leaders in the country. He became the CEO at the age of 21. He can tell us more about it. He's come here to Cambridge. He's working toward his MPP here at the school while continuing to uh, direct this effort from United Leaders. He's a, everyone at the school here knows him. Everybody says, what's Larry Harris up to now? <laughs> Larry, what are you up to? How did you, how'd you get here? How did, how did you, at, at, in this modern age, did you get drawn <coughs> into, into this idealism, this commitment to service and to leadership? Sure. Um, well, let me start with an admission. Uh, Senator Pryor has actually been an elected official longer than I've been alive, so I, 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 uh, <laughs> I feel like the nightingale that I'm going to reference is probably going to come tap me on the shoulder at any minute and say, thanks for keeping my chair warm, boy. Um, I, I, um, I'd like to answer the question by trying to encapsulate a little bit about this millennial generation of Americans that are you know, born in 1978 and, and a little bit younger than that. Um, you know, this generation is overwhelmingly inspired by uh, service, by community service. 80% uh, of college students volunteer in some capacity. Uh, I think that the nightingales from my generation and people that I would point to are people that founded nonprofits, social entrepreneurs like Alan Casey that started City Year or Wendy Kopp that started Teach for America. And then on the elected side, people like John McCain, who you know, straight talked young people into uh, a frenzy about his campaign. And also people like Cory Booker, who you should uh, go check out in, in Newark, New Jersey, running for mayor pretty soon. Um, people that really uh, got out there and, and, and ran uh, campaigns, not only as politicians, but also as servants, and combined that, that community service that young people are so inspired by with the political service that Governor Shaheen talked about. Um, and also did it with idealism. And I think that's really the key is people want to see courage and idealism in political leadership. And, and the things that John F. Kennedy talked about um, completely encapsulated that. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Larry talks about the idealism of this younger generation. And I think those of us who have the privilege to be in the classrooms with them find that there is a there is a, a an urge a drive to serve the country and there's also i might add a, a a spiritual search among many of these young people that's perhaps different from what some of you may have experienced at this school 10 or 20 years ago it's a very interesting generation and yet many of them reject politics they don't th they think there's somehow something that's tarnished about it and many of them are disinterested in seeking lives as career public servants because they think many of the jobs at the federal government or indeed state government are dead end jobs. And my question to you all, you all is, what should we be doing to, uh, to change this so that po A, politics itself seems more noble and B, that career, say, as a foreign service officer or as a civil servant, once again becomes attractive place to put one's, invest one's energies. David, could you, could you start, to, all of you have thought about this some, and I'm, I'm just curious if we can go down here about those two issues. Well, if I may, and there's so many young people here today who may be thinking about politics and public service, public life as, as a life's work, and it, in, in my opinion, like Dan Glickman, there is no more exciting calling than public service. And uh, I was drawn into it very early. I've been in it all my life. I have no regrets. I don't have much money to show for it. But, you know, that doesn't matter. And I tell you, it's just absolutely a wonderful calling. I would encourage the young people here today, if you're looking and searching and can't quite find your niche and not sure if you really are interested in this as a field of life's endeavor, get in your car and go to Abilene, Kansas and go through the Eisenhower Presidential Library and spend four or five hours there as Barbara and I did lately. Go on over to Independence, Missouri. Spend four or five hours in Harry Truman's <coughs> library and see what it took to create, for example, the Marshall Plan. See the guts and the courage it took in the face of about 4% of the American people supporting the Marshall Plan. Old Harry Truman says, we're going to rebuild Europe and we're going to do it this way. And I've got George Marshall and, and by gosh, we're going to do it. And they did it. 
And it, would t it took courage. Go to, go to Austin and see LBJ's library. Go to uh, College Station and see George Bush, uh, for George Bush One's library. And, and these presidential libraries, in the Carter Center in Atlanta, these, these wonderful institutions are reservoirs, in my opinion, of strength and inspiration. You can read about them in the books, but, but when you see the handwritten letters from Eisenhower to Mamie, when you see Harry writing to Bess Truman, when you see the decisions being made on uh, sort of early communications between Harry Truman and others about whether to drop the atomic bomb or what to do about uh, the, the uh, invasion of Normandy, Eisenhower and his people, Oh, it is thrilling to think of the major and monumental decisions that have been made. And it is also very exciting to think that we in this time and have the opportunity to go back and really delve into how those decisions uh, took place and how they uh, developed. And I think that's one place to start. But I also would encourage people, we've got a great year to do it. Get involved in a presidential campaign. Man, this is the year coming up. <laughs> Uh, get invited. Doesn't matter Republican or Democrat, right, left, whatever. Get out there and get with it. Start knocking on those doors. You'll be rebuffed and you'll be told to get off the front porch and don't bother <laughs> my uh, soap opera and whatever. But just appeal to those people that this is a major decision that we've got to make in this country. And the young people of this country can be a major part of that major decision. Didn't mean to go so long, excuse me. No, that's terrific, that's good. I, I, I do also want to open, as we go down here, Gene, you talk about this. I, I, I'm, I'm really curious, I, this, this job question is a big deal for a lot of students coming through this school and other public policy schools, indeed through the college and the law school. These folks don't want to go work in government unless they can get a high-ranking political appointment. The idea of going to the Foreign Service is just not appealing. The idea of going into the Civil Service is just not appealing to a lot of them. So I'm just want to, I want to introduce that in the conversation as we go through. Jean. You know, I, I actually just had this conversation with some students this week about why they're not interested in political service. And, and I defined public service for them as political service. And, they said a number of things to me. They said, well, we don't see how it affects our lives. You know, we're in college, we're not paying taxes yet. And one student spoke up and said, well, I, I do pay withholding. Um, but they also said, politicians don't speak to us directly. And we had this whole conversation where I said, well, you know, one of the problems when you're running for office is that you speak to the people who vote. And unfortunately, too many young people don't vote. And so it becomes this um, cycle that just continues. And I think one of the things that we've got to do as elected le officials and as community leaders is to talk to young people about the importance of public service and encourage them um, to get in and, and to let them know there are a lot of ways to do it, that you don't have to run for office. You know, I spent 15 years um, working in presidential politics for candidates before I ran myself. And the person who's sitting there licking the stamps, who's knocking on the doors, is just as important in getting something done as the person who's at the podium. So we've got to let young people know that they can make a difference and they have to get involved because we depend on them. Um, the next generation is the generation that's going to make this country work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll uh, give a little advertisement to the Institute of Politics. Uh, we're, uh, we do annual polling on this issue to try to survey students nationally. And we run the most extensive national surveys in the country at any university. Mm -hmm. We're doing two a year now trying to ascertain what is it that either leaves people out of the system or encourages people to come into the system. And I would encourage you all here to get to, and we'll get you access to all of that information because I think it's uh, pretty useful. Uh, and it's complicated. As H.L. Mencken once said, there's, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. And this is one that is must, one of the most complicated problems in the world. How do you marry the politician and the uh, leader in government with a, with a student or a young person who wants to perhaps build a career 
here. Uh, one of the things that struck me, or there are a couple things here. As Gene said, you know, Willie Sutton once was asked why we, he robs banks, and his answer was, of course, because that's where the money is. And politicians are asked, why do you focus your campaigns on senior citizens, veterans, farmers, small business people, women's groups? Same reason, because that's where the votes are. Politics today, I think, is, is viewed as a way to narrow the base and then get a bigger percentage of those people that you can narrow. Whereas that kind of turns an awful lot of people who haven't figured out what base they're in just yet to come into the system. So somehow, this is a double-edged sword. We've got to encourage people to participate, to vote, and to do those kinds of things. But we've got to figure out how we can get politicians to, A, be good role models, as David Gergen has written about over and over again, because it does make a difference if they respect you and they think you're living a good life. That, that helps. And the other way is to recognize that we have millions of young people here who aren't pigeonholed in any particular base. They're not liberals or conservatives necessarily, Democrats or Republicans, but that's no reason to exclude them from the process. And that, to a large extent, I have to tell you, is what I think American politicians tend to do right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, if I can just have a follow-up comment on that. It's been striking me talking to people in, uh, in the presidential campaigns and the, the two parties now that they... The, the old rule of the presidential election campaign was that you have your base, you mobilize your base first, and then you go to the middle. And there's a big, vast middle of 15 percent, 20 percent, and you run your campaign by appealing to the middle. And now increasingly, certainly among Republicans, there's a view that the middle is disappearing and becoming fractured, and it's, it's much, much smaller, and the bases are bigger, and the way to run a national campaign is to appeal to keep appealing to your base. Don't go to the middle, appeal to your base. And get as many out as you can. Put a lot more money into turnout. And mobilize, and that's the way you can win. Uh, and that means that there will be less appeal to the people in the middle, and maybe even less appeal to young people. Well, one thing I would just tell you, what we've done here at Harvard at the IOP, mm -hmm. we do not let people register for their classes unless they register to vote. We do like a, if you look at the arteries here at Harvard, it's almost, there's a, there's a clogged artery to get in to get your picture taken and to get voting registered, to get registered for classes, and that is the IOP. We had the President University, Larry Summers out here, we registered 80%, I don't know what the number was, but it was a big chunk of the freshmen. You can't force them to register, but when you look like you've got blocking tackles before they can get into the room, they register. Every The federal law requires colleges to facilitate uh, registration by college students. Most don't do a darn thing in this area to speak of. They might have a booth for the Republican, young Republicans and young Democrats. There are techniques that you can use to try to get kids into the process a little faster and a little more effectively, and I, we're going to try to replicate that around the country it's if we can. Interesting. Larry. I, uh, I was going to say, uh, Senator Pryor made uh, some really important comments, because I, I uh, spent this summer, I had the opportunity to speak at the John F. Kennedy Library and then to, to drive up to Hyannis and visit the memorial and, and through some very high-powered binoculars, I could kind of see the compound. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I just wanted to say that, that for a political dork like me, someone that goes to the Kennedy School of Government and, and enjoyed the premiere of K Street on HBO, um, going to the library is probably one of the most inspiring things that would ever happen in my life and would get me into public service. But I'm not the average you know, person in my generation. I am already, I have the propensity to be involved in service and, and government. Um, I think it's appropriate that this forum was named after John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, because he had his foot in two generations. Uh, for, for his father's generation, the President of the United States talked about the upkeep of government and excellence and recruiting the best and brightest. And now if you look at political rhetoric, there's not as much of that anymore. And that, that's kind of dissipated over the years. And what uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. tried to do is really reach out through new media and, and through pop culture to try to reach young people and, and you know, different ways of trying to reach this generation. And I'd say that for, for my generation, um, one of the things that, that uh, I think they're waiting for is, it, are the people that are going to keep doing that. You know, where's the leadership around um, transitioning AmeriCorps graduates into political service? You have such a large uh, group of people who, who care about the country and want to change the world. How do you get those people to then consider public policy as a vehicle for changing the world as well? Um, and, and, and you know, one of the things that the Institute of Politics has always been great on is trying to bridge that gap and getting kids from Harvard Yard who would go volunteer in a soup kitchen to consider the Senate. And that's, that's one of the things that United Leaders is trying to do also, is really get those kids to see 
both sides of the public sector as a viable option for changing the world. Larry, let me come back to, to uh, your point you just made about uh, coming out of AmeriCorps. You spoke earlier about Alan Casey, uh, and he, mm -hmm. he was uh, one of your role models. Uh, he and Michael Brown c coming here as undergraduates, going on to the law school, formed an organization called City Year, uh, and it's a very vibrant group, just like Wendy Kopp forming the Teach for America. Uh, as you know, Alan and Wendy and others who are in the national service movement are deeply alarmed right now about potential for devastating cuts, which are in the works right now. They're going to face cuts as much as 30, 40, 50 percent at the hands of a Congress and an executive branch that seem indifferent to their fate. How much is that going to affect your generation? Are you involved in this fight? Yeah, uh, I, I would. You know, at a time where uh, more young Americans are interested in service than ever before, you know, our generation, and, and you know, my parents don't like it when I say this, but our generation actually is more active than the greatest generation in terms of the numbers of people getting involved. At a time where so many young Americans are interested in service, it strikes me as a little bit um, off mission to be cutting AmeriCorps. The President of the United States called for a 50% increase uh, in AmeriCorps, and, and, and I agree with him. There should be an increase. There should be not only an increase, there should be leadership on trying to transition those young people into political service. And, and I think what's going to happen, you know, post World War II, you saw an increase, a spike in civic uh, interest amongst people who, you know, you know, average Americans, young people, old people, there were institutions in place like the Civilian Defense Corps and the Rock Gardens that got people to turn that civic interest into sustained civic engagement. Where are those institutions today? One of them is AmeriCorps, and we should not be talking about cutting it because that's, that's one of the ways we're going to really turn that interest into sustained engagement. Yeah, Jean, you? Well, I want to pick up on that because I think it's worse than just that we're seeing our elected leaders today say, be, be indifferent to this. What we're seeing, and I talked to people in New Hampshire who are trying to promote um, AmeriCorps and trying to address the budget cuts at the federal level. And what they tell me is that they've talked to the elected officials there and they say they support it, but there's nothing they can do. And it's that kind of response that makes young people cynical about the political process. Mm -hmm. Could I say something, David? Two things. One, Larry has brought up the Kennedy Library, which is just four or five miles from here, and I certainly should have mentioned that because uh, geographically that is so easy for students in this area to, to go through. And if you want inspiration to, to find a role in public service, that I don't know of a, a, a higher calling than to go through that library and be inspired by it. A graduate stu a student here at the mid-career program at one stage about three years ago was Michelle Nunn. Michelle Nunn, the daughter of, of Senator Nunn and Colleen Nunn in Georgia. Michelle has founded something, speaking of AmeriCorps, she's founded something called Hands on Atlanta. She started it by herself. One young woman with an idea, with a burning call to do something for her city, to make a contribution to her city. Michelle Nunn started this little organization, and now she has over 10,000 volunteers in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. It's one of the great success stories of American volunteerism. This was a young woman who's, who attended right here, who used to sit right here in these forums as you are today. And uh, I, I think that there are so many examples like that of people who don't wait for the call to get involved. They do it themselves. And that's what's so important, I think, when we're in tough times like we are with AmeriCorps funding. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to pursue a couple of other questions here, and then we'll open this up, and we'll, we're going to stop shortly before 12 o'clock. But I want to come back to you, Dan Glickman, and ask you this question. And then I want to talk a little politics. Uh, President Summers has said on more than one occasion that he wants to make na a public service a hallmark of his presidency here at the, at the university. He wants to encourage more people to go into public service. He's looking for ways to uh, encourage the, the professional schools, the Kennedy School, the Law School, the Business School, the public health, education, to work more closely together to encourage people to go into public service. I want to know if you were going to sit down with Larry, and I know you've done this some already, and you wanted to give him an agenda for what should Harvard be doing 
to encourage public service, whether it be more internships. We don't have enough internships here at the school to, for people to go out and work with mentors and nightingales. We do, uh, more opportunities to work here in the, in the, in the, in the community. Uh, University of Michigan, your home university. I, I was on the campus yesterday and, uh, to, for, to celebrate uh, President Ford. And they pointed out with such pride the steps where President Kennedy had given the speech for the Peace Corps at the University of Michigan. But only a mile away, there was an open field where not only the people who, this university not only honors civil service, but a mile away, they had students marching in uniforms as part of ROTC. Should this university bring back ROTC so we honor people in military uniforms and honor that as a part of service as well? What would you recommend to President Summers about well, what he ought to be doing to, to uh, I, I to probably wouldn't him. make an initial recommendation on ROTC to him. I'd let <laughs> other people handle that one. But I, I tell you what, one is I'd have to, my, my impression based on what the, what the Institute of Politics does, the Kennedy School does, Phillips Brooks House on the campus, which is the big uh, entity encouraging uh, public service, is, is that Harvard probably overall is in a leadership role in the country in terms of, but here's what I would do. I would make sure that the, all the mentors and role models at this university, especially the teachers here, have this as part of their agenda. That is, I think you can set up all sorts of programs, but my impression is there are an <coughs> awful lot of people who work here at the university who may not themselves believe that public service and politics makes all that much difference and therefore may send mixed messages to students as to what value in life there is beyond just the academic level. Now I can't give you any quantifiable evidence of this, but if I were Larry Summers I would be talking to all the department heads and in my conversations with faculty here I would tell them that, that uh, an educated student in, in my mind is just as much how you train young minds into believing that they can change the entire world and in doing so I think you can set an environment here by then a lot of the infrastructure that can then come about it. Uh, you know I've had some conversations with some professors here who are in fact more cynical about politics than a lot of the students are mm. and, mm. and uh, you know regardless whether they've been burned or whether they got feeling that their ideological views aren't being represented here I think that you've got to really focus on the role models at a school like this and make sure they themselves are convinced that this is the right thing to do. And that's, that moral leadership, that moral suasion is where I'd start. Yeah, it was interesting, I, I, I'm reflecting on that, because as, as each of you spoke about what drew you in, it was often a moral question about what, what, what you, you were talking about you know, teaching in Mississippi and seeing that and Jimmy Carter and how that you know, and and you talked about you know you ran against Phobos and you talked about the women and your it, it is often the, the moral dimension that inspires and I, I think that's what you've been trying to appeal to is uh, as well Larry but it the is. idealistic side most definitely and, and I think you know building off of uh, Secretary Glickman's comments on on most college campuses if not all the largest organization is a volunteer service organization Phillips Brooks House here uh, at my alma mater Tufts, it's uh, the Lincoln Filene Center, I'm sorry, uh, the, the uh, well, Lincoln Filene Center and, and uh, U University College of Citizenship and Public Service. I would say that there needs to be a, build, a bridge built between the organizations that are you know, doing service, direct service on campuses, and those that are, that are uh, you know, working on politics. Build a bridge straight from the yard, right to the Institute of Politics that brings kids from Phil Phillips Brooks House here. Because those kids do have that, that moral suasion did appeal to them and they, they want to see you know, hunger and homelessness and, and housing be addressed in this country and they, they want to find a way to do it and they're turning toward nonprofits and, and, and volunteerism to do it rather than public policy. Yeah, yeah. well there was this very much the spirit Tom Hayden had way back when in the, in the 60s. It was something of an anger about what, where we were going as, and what we represented. It drew a lot of people in that generation. David. Uh, David, I think when a lot of students come to Harvard or the University of Arkansas or wherever, they come, many of them secretly knowing that there is a reason or a why that they should somehow or another engage in public service. The, what they don't know the answer to is how. They know the why, the why is there. They don't know how. And I think an institution like this can help students find out how to do it. 
I did this class uh, with Mickey Edwards when I was here. It was the greatest time I ever had every Monday and Wednesday. I don't know if we taught him one thing, but we talked about, <laughs> so you want to be a politician. That was the name of our class. We had 80 students. It was wonderful fun. We told stories about campaigning and how you choose your logo, how you get people to go and vote, uh, tracking the people who vote in the school board elections because they're going to vote in the rest of the elections. I mean, finding the voters that are going to turn out and and it, all of that is the how part. And I think that Harvard University uh, can be a part of that too. I, there's, a, there, there's another nightingale in this audience, Dick Neustadt. Wherever you go today in this country, I don't care if it's Newsweek magazine or, or, or uh, Congress or the House, Senate, you name it, there's someone who was inspired by Dick Neustadt here at Harvard at the Institute of Politics. I mean. He has more people that he has influenced. Each of us can influence one or two or three people in our own way, and I think we all have that challenge and that commitment to uh, hopefully that feel that response. I, 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 I wondered if we could ask Dick Neustadt to stand, because so many of us were He's a great man. Yes, please. <clears throat> He's a nightingale, David. He is indeed. He is indeed. I want to ask you one, one final question. Gene, you're in New Hampshire. David, you are just in Arkansas kicking off Wes Clark's campaign. How is this Iraq question going to play in our politics here for the next year? It's 14, 16 months. I, I, I'm tempted to talk to Walter Shorenstein about what's happening in California, but let's, let's stick to Iraq right now. <coughs> Walter, you can tell us later. Walter, are you on the ballot this year in California? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You, you'll, you'll accept the draft. It's, it's too late, I think. I don't know. Maybe it's on the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but tell us a little bit about how, the, how Iraq's going to play out, the politics of that, and how that's affecting uh, Maybe our, our, our... New Hampshire could answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pass me the heart. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's already affected the presidential race on the Democratic side, clearly. A lot of the momentum that Howard Dean has gotten that's moved him into the front runner's position has been because of his opposition to the war in Iraq. And I, I think we are going to continue to see that be an issue um, unless something gets resolved in the next six months, and I'm not optimistic that that will happen. Um, I, I think one of the difficult pieces about the question for Democrats um, particularly for those people who voted to support the president initially, is that in the public's mind, <coughs> this war has gotten connected to terrorism. And even though there's no real evidence to show that um, Iraq was supporting terrorists, that's how the public views it. And so it's going to be very difficult, I think, for Democrats to, to talk about how we get out in a way that um, doesn't have Democrats in the public's mind in general as being soft on terrorism. And I think it's a real dilemma. And is that, if that's the question, is Wes Clark the answer? Well, I'm not. <laughs> well. You, you no, the only thing, there are some parallels in history, and if you look at 1952, the presidential race, General Eisenhower was the answer. Uh, Korea was not Iraq, but there was the general, and remember General Eisenhower, up until fairly close to the time he decided what he was going to do, wasn't sure which party he was going to affiliate with, um, which has some parallels with General Clark. So, you know, it's, there, there, there are some parallels in history that show that, um, uh, people do look to uh, new kinds of leadership to deal with a problem, which I, I, while I agree with Gene, I also believe that this question of trust of the president is being challenged very directly right now. And if things don't change, that is going to, to I think, have a material impact on the presidential race. Yeah. I, I, I would have to add that uh, while I think there, the president is in a deteriorating position, uh, and I think his, the, the credibility question is now has become a, a serious campaign issue that in many parts of the country, I, I, I just talked to, uh, uh, um, to people in North Carolina and uh, 
I have to Erskine Bowles is thinking of running for the Senate and, and, and a Democratic side. And he, he would just tell you, in a state like North Carolina, it's still solid Bush country. And, and, it's a, and there are many, many states in the country where that is true. I think south of Washington, D.C., it's hard to think of a state, perhaps Florida, that would go the other way. So this is a, it's still a situation where the Democrats have to make the case and have to find a candidate. David, I, I rem was it in May when uh, President Bush landed on the aircraft carrier? Yes, May 1. Uh, Tom Cruise. And he, he landed, whatever. <laughs> I said, and, and I, I, the war. Yeah, yeah, the war was over. Right. I, I, I looked at the TV screen. I said, boy, that's going to be a tremendously effective TV spot, 30 seconds. I can just see it now. I'm not so sure they're going to run that yeah, spot. Yeah, so you think. Yeah. I, I mean, I, they you, may. You, Listen, you they know, may. The Democrats they may, may run it now, right? They, they <laughs> may. <laughs> but, but that's how, that's how things sort of change. And, and uh, I'm not sure that they're going to do it. I mean, I, I don't think I would advise them. He didn't ask me about it, but I don't think I would advise him to do it. You know, Senator right Pryor, now. Th that actually yeah, brings up, um, reminds me of a quote. Uh, one of the presidents that uh, people in my generation look up to is actually not really a president. He was um, Andrew Shepard from The American President, the movie. And he said in the movie, um, in a speech, that, you know, we have, you know, serious problems in this country and we need serious people to solve them. You know, if the best and brightest people are going into the private sector rather than the public sector for careers, um, you know, one of the things I believe is you can't change the world in your spare time. E.B. White once said that, I wake up every morning determined to change the world and have a good time, which makes planning the day a little difficult. Well, <laughs> plan your day a lot easier, get into the public sector and use your talent and your passion at the same time. Good, Larry. Good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, the floor is op open. We welcome uh, any of those of uh, you who'd like to ask a question, make a comment. Uh, you, we, we, we can, yes, sir, if there, you come over to this microphone, sir, that would be, uh, that'd be most helpful. If you'd introduce yourself as well, and we would welcome that. And thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Bob Madison. Uh, I'm from Bennington, Vermont. Uh, I was a graduate of the uh, Litauer School, as it was then called, uh, in 1941. Wow. Um, and I would like to comment this, thus. Uh, there, was, there was one aspect of this question, which I think has been touched on a little bit at the end. Uh, I think that one of the most difficult things in terms today of getting people to enter the public service, and in terms of the public servant being effective, is that the public, by and large, does not believe what they are being told by their leaders. That is disastrous in a democratic society. You get throughout the country, you talk with people, not only literate people such as we are, but people who are people of the street. They do not believe what they are being told. And then that is permeating down to the state level and the local governmental level. We've got to do something about it. Can I ask you this question? Yes. Are you saying that with regard to this particular administration, or are you saying that with regard to a broader point I'm saying that covers it, several I'm saying both. It is with regard to this particular administration, which has greatly aggravated the problem. But that is a problem of the public service by and large. A great many people don't believe what they're being told. Now, I think it is incumbent upon people who consider themselves career public servants to pull the chain, draw the limits, say there are certain things that you can do for spin, but you can't go beyond it. If you do, it's going to backfire. Thank you. D D Dan Gleckman, this goes deep with you. Dan? Well, I, I think where I agree with you on your point is, I mean, there are a lot of public servants that people do believe at the state and local level. There are a lot of there are a lot of people in politics who are not viewed as scum. But uh, but I do agree with you that uh, it is an unfortunate thing this kind of lack of trust and lack of belief in anything that our leaders say, and a lot of our leaders uh, perpetuate that, particularly in the campaign system that we have with the necessity to raise money and to spend money in the way that we do, and the importance, as David has written about, about people of good character, role models, taking a leadership position and, and trying to speak as truthfully as you can in a political system which makes it very, very tricky because of the nature of how we finance campaigns. Right. Read the last sentence of the day's first editorial in the New York Times. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, my name is T. Taggart, and I was in what was called city planning in 1973, now part of the um, Kennedy School, clearly. And I 
have worked for many years actually in the private sector in the investment area. But I'm very curious, given um, I think we all would acknowledge the really, one of the really seminal things in the Kennedy-Nixon uh, election was the use of a new media uh, and television. And if you think about the internet and uh, the, the web orientation of a lot of younger voters today, my question really is, how do you think uh, the internet will and can be best used in electoral politics? Well, we ask uh, two people that. Uh, uh, Larry, from a young perspective, and Gene, you watched it, and how it's affecting New Hampshire, Larry. Sure. Uh, I would say that probably the best way, and, and this is internet or not internet, is to be innovative and creative about whatever you're doing. That um, there's a tremendous amount of talent in this generation around trying to find you know, great ways of reaching out to people, whether it's through television or through the internet. And you know, one, one person that's done that really well so far is, is Governor Dean and his campaign and finding the, the newest and most cutting edge kind of technology, web logging, um, flash mobbing, like all, the, all these different kind of weird sounding things that are very effective and, are, and, and at heart are just grassroots tools that are used through the internet. You know, so try to find the innovative ways that transition old methods of reaching out to people to new media and new mediums for reaching out to people. Jane? I, I would echo what Larry has said. Clearly the internet is going to be a bigger and bigger part of how people campaign in the future. I, I think there's a concern about that, however, and that is that the people who have internet access tend to be upper income, better educated, and I think there is the potential to leave even further behind minorities, um, people who don't have as much money, who are not as well educated, the people who, for whom the political process has the best opportunity to make a difference in their lives. And so I think that would be very sad. I'm, I'm, I, please, Dave. No, I was just Yeah, I was going to go here. I wanted to say, I just wanted to add one. On, uh, the, the internet has been a godsend to nonprofit organizations and to organizers. You know, the whole effort to ban landmine treaties that, that and a woman won a, uh, won a Nobel Prize for this was done over the internet. And the, for the, as much as we, uh, many of us, oppose what they're doing, the people who are organizing against globalization, against the World Trade Organization are doing it through the internet. It's become a, a very rapid, and you can put a demonstration in the street in less than 24 hours, mm -hmm. almost Don't anywhere in the world now because of the internet. It's, it's a stunning development. And everybody. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm Dr. Phil Caper, I'm once one time Kennedy School faculty member, now School of Public Health. Um, I like the panel's view of what the influence of, the apparent influence of money on the decisions of elected and appointed public officials has had on the view young people may have of politics and uh, the, the rising level of cynicism about politics. I think money is the most, uh, and, well, let's see, let me agree. I think that money and the necessity of raising the quantities of money uh, for a uh, a politician today is the most debilitating factor in our whole electoral system. I think if there's anything that I, I worry about getting the vote out, only less than 50% of us vote anymore. I worry about all of that. But the thing that I worry about most is the necessity of the amount of money that it takes uh, to run for public office. Well, I, let me give you an example. Let me, I'll give you Tell us about your son. Actually. Well, I'll give you a, well, I'll talk to, talk to you just a sec. <laughs> he got involved in that campaign and I was up here, uh, I was I, I was so fortunate to be associated in the, in the now held Glickman position as director of the Institute <laughs> and following Richard Newstad and others. Uh, Mark Pryor told Barbara and myself one night in Little Rock at Jason's Deli, he says, well, I'm going to run for the Senate. And I said, pardon? He <laughs> says, I'm going to run for the Senate. And I said, state Senate? He said, no, the United States Senate. I said, oh, okay. So anyway, we got involved in the race and we met, had a conference call with fundraisers and whatever, four or five of us on the phone. Here's a little state like Arkansas, two and a half million people, whatever. Last time I ran for office, I spent $1.8 million, and that set all kind of records in that state. And we started talking about what it was going to cost Mark to run for the, for the United States Senate, six million bucks. I said, Mark, we can't raise that kind of money. You cannot raise that kind of money in Arkansas. Well, 
We raised $6 million. I do not know where it came from. Uh, but we raised it. But I'm going to tell you what. It took him six and seven hours every day, every day on that telephone. And I, I don't know that that's what a candidate should be doing today. And I, I am very worried about the system. I don't know how you get out of it. I, I don't know what you do about it. I wish there were equal time. I wish the elections were shorter. You run up against the First Amendment all that stuff, maybe some of my colleagues do, but it is very, very scary. Well, let me add, having just gone through this process, I second everything you've said, but I don't think the way to fix it is the McCain-Feingold legislation. And as much as I support campaign finance reform, I fear that that changes one unlevel playing field for another unlevel playing field. And until we're willing to support public financing of campaigns, or, or public access to the media, we are not going to be able to change the system in any dramatic way, I don't believe. I, I just I, I echo exactly what both of them said, and I make one other point. Most people don't give a candidate for the United States Senate or President or Congress money out of the goodness of their hearts. Most people give money because they want to get their point of view across, which is perfectly legitimate in the American political system. But when you're raising $1 million that way versus having to raise $10 million that way, those points of view take on a lot bigger perspective. And you, it just defies the laws of nature to believe that it won't happen that way. And uh, I think that's the thing that troubles me most about the process. And it's not just young people that are affected by it. There's a poll, Fox News poll, which I think is especially credible given the administration being conservative. 60% of American mothers would not want their children to grow up to be president of the United States. Uh, the cynicism is, is not only in, in our generation, but it's in yours too. And, and you know, the one thing I would say is I, I, did, I studied uh, New York City's public finance uh, law, and, and the one thing that really struck me about it is it's smart legislation because it's optional, it's credible, and uh, it's viable. It, it's public financing, but it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not regulated. So, you know, one thing that I would say, if we're looking for models for how to improve the way that we do campaigns, New York City's got a great one, and, and the amount of people that ended up running for a citywide election in New York City because of that, uh, because of that legislation, it was unprecedented and, and amazing. Another spin on what Larry said about people wanting their children to be president, I've always heard that a lot of people out there want their children to grow up to be president, but they don't want them to be a politician. So, uh, <laughs> They're a virginal birth, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're running, our time is running short. I'm, I would certainly like to start down this road. We'll see how far we go, uh, pl please. And we're going to be uh, br be brief quick. on both sides. My name is Lisa Screeton. I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm a graduate in MPA 2 2000 here at the Kennedy School. And I just wanted to say that two of my greatest nightingales are here, Senator Pryor and Barbara Pryor. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. And I never had a chance to publicly thank you, and this saves me the price of a stamp. I hope you don't mind. Well, Lisa, thank you. But in the fifth grade, we baked cookies for the David Pryor for Governor campaign Yay. and raised $48. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. We've done it ever since. I've been in public service all my life. I'm poor as a church mouse and deliriously happy. Thank you. You're wonderful. Wow, thank you. Very nice. Wow. Thank you. Well, now, the better half of that equation has to stand up. Yeah, Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm, uh, <clears throat> my name is John Parasol. I'm from Canada, actually, and I was at the Kennedy School about 15 years ago. I come normally to these uh, forums. I haven't been here for a few years, and I normally stay quiet, and I listen. I, I learn a lot from listening. But uh, <clears throat> today's uh, panel was extremely uh, inspiring and uh, and as a result, I would like to just share a few things with you. Number one, my nightingale as a Canadian, curiously enough, was Robert Kennedy. Because mm -hmm. uh, I was also a product of the 60s. And um, I always wanted to do, to get involved in a primary campaign, even though I'm a Canadian. And I had the opportunity to go to New Hampshire back in the year 2000 and worked with uh, Bill Bradley's campaign for a full week, speaking to the French electors of, uh, of New Hampshire since I'm bilingual, so I was able to be uh, of use. And I intend to bring a number of students from a university in Montreal in the next primary to get involved as well, not just as observers, but as help, as volunteers and people who get involved. But the basic message I'm trying to convey is that 
I don't think we can change the system with a quick fix solution. Um, and I think what you are doing and what many of us are doing in this room here is we're staying involved. And I think we have to encourage people to get involved, to share the passion of, of getting involved in public service. I accept whenever I'm uh, invited to speak at high school convocations and the subject matter that I touch upon is always public service. I spent 25 years, I'm in the private sector now, but I'm still involved in all NGO activities. I never accept, I would not accept a paid board. I always get involved in NGO activities and I still get involved in politics and because of my experience with the American system, I'm actually involved on television in French commenting uh, the, the system. And I re read your book, which was very inspiring, Mr. Gergen. So all I'm saying, the message I'm conveying to everybody here is stay involved. Take time to speak to young people because we won't be able to change the system by decrying the system. We're going to change the system by encouraging people to get in it and make the change from within. So that's Thanks. my Thanks. Very good. <laughs> Very good, point. good. Thank you for speaking. I, and and uh, you, you, you remind us as, as you come here from Canada, one of the reasons that we're proud of this school is that we have the highest number of international students at this school of any in, of any part of Harvard, of any school in Harvard, the highest number, and it changes the conversation enormously and enriches the conversation in a very positive way. You have the last word. All right. Um, I'm Susan Hackley. I'm a graduate of this wonderful school, MPA 94, and I'm managing director of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. And um, I think we skipped over the role of the military pretty quickly. My son just came back from Iraq with the, with the Marines. Thank goodness he's back. And I think we should think about sending our best and brightest into the military or into peacekeeping. We're going to have so many people, so many Americans are going to be the face to the world who are serving abroad. And whether they're in the military and they go on to run for president, as um, General Clark is, or if they are learning to be peacekeepers over there, I, I think there's just such a sense of urgency and we should think about our military and the role they can play. Very good. Good. Thank you for uh, making that comment. <laughs> and, uh, do you have any reflections on your son's service? We, 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 we salute you for that, your family. So much worse. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I thank hope you. he will. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps it would be wonderful if we could have a forum here of, of young Americans coming back from Iraq. I mean, oh, Seth I Moulton, who was a Harvard student a couple of years ago, a year yeah. and a half ago. He, class speaker, he volunteered for the Marine Corps, he went to Iraq, there are others who are there now. It would be wonderful yeah. to bring them back. I, I think they might encourage us to get ROTC back. I'd like to see it done. Uh, but, it, but, it, but we thank you for your service and because you do help us to understand there are many forms of service and military service is one we honor and we thank you. This has been a marvelous way to, to start the day and we thank you for coming. I want to ask you if you could thank our panelists, David Pryor, Jean Shaheen, Dan Fleckman, and Larry Harris. And Don. Mm -hmm. I thought you kind of good. Oh, he's good. Yeah. good. Dan, thank you. Gene, that was good to be with you. Mm -hmm. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gene. Yeah, that's a great, that'd be a one. Hey Richard, hey, yes you do. You 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 are one least thank you for